Good morning. Uh, we're going to save some time for questions at the end from the audience, so write them down if you got them. CC, I watched a short interview with you, and the woman asked you, uh, what qualities do people in leadership trying to get health coverage for all, what do they need now? And your response was interesting. You said, until recently, I used to say agility, and now it is resilience. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, I think that probably most of the folks in this room are well aware that um, healthcare has become a bit of a slog in the United States. Uh, hate to confess how many decades some of us have been at this, and it feels like we're repeating ourselves with many of the same challenges that kind of keep coming back around. Uh, I think that particularly for leaders, uh, you've got to be willing to take a few knocks along the way and be able to not only get up again, but also start looking around corners for different types of creative solutions uh, because the old ones clearly are not catching on. Why do we pe keep repeating the same mistakes? Oh gosh, because uh, we're human. <laughs> Um, because healthcare is complicated, and because, in my view, there's a lot of money coursing through the healthcare system, and there are a lot of perverse financial incentives right now in our healthcare system that prompt not necessarily the best behavior. And you also said you have to be willing to take knocks. Give me an example of a knock someone should be willing to take. Well, I'll use one that Matt and I just lived through a few months ago. Uh, the individual market, which is relatively small in the United States, but serves a very important function for a segment of our society that can't typically get health insurance coverage anyplace else. Uh, there was a very reasonable bipartisan proposal for reinsurance. You see it in places like Alaska today, as a matter of fact. And at the end of the day, you know, it, it fell to allegedly abortion politics. And uh, it's disappointing because the people that are going to pay that price are those working Americans who are going to have increasing trouble getting affordable coverage and care. Matt, a lot of people are very nervous about 2019 because they don't know what the heck these plans are going to cost. Right. How are you feeling about that, the uncertainty of all that? Yeah, I mean, to build on what CeCe said, I mean, we are concerned about 2019, and I think that was why we worked so hard, um, you know, up through the um, omnibus package and pushing as hard as we did. We think that the, the policy was agreed to, and that's, um, I think, the most frustrating thing is that people recognize that, you know, a sizable reinsurance program would push down premiums um, by funding the cost-sharing payments. That would, uh, you know, help uh, push down premiums over the long term and make it so that the government isn't paying more uh, for, um, for people to get premium subsidies. And then the flexibility piece that would allow the states to you know, make some modifications. I think you know, there was bipartisan agreement, um, but you know, when you think about things like the individual mandate going away, um, some of the other proposed rules that are being put in place, whether it be around association plans, short-term policies, right? The, it's just still a nasty soup right now that's that's brewing, um, and we're looking ahead to 2019. And um, you know, it's it's not a it's not a really great picture right now. But I know a lot of um, companies are committed to the market. They want to make sure people have access to coverage at the most affordable price. But they also has to reflect sort of what the reality is right now, and it's. It's not, a, it's not a pretty picture right now. I'm going to dive into some of those things you mentioned, but I find your background really interesting because <laughs> uh -oh. you've worked at the Congressional Budget Office. Right. You've worked for Aetna, Don't Eli Lilly. Don't that against me. No, but I think it's interesting, you, and now you're representing the insurance folks. So can you tell us something that you've learned throughout your career in these different places that you think will influence the way you handle your new job when you take over? Oh, uh, sure. Great, great. So, at the Congressional Budget Office, I worked with some of the you know, smartest, most talented people. I was uh, like right out of grad school. I had no idea how much power I had at age 24 <laughs> in terms of looking at legislation. It was ridiculous. Um, but it also made me look sort of holistically at issues and the people that were there, many of them who still are, um, uh, you know, really taught me a lot about being critical and trying to examine things from every angle. And, you know, I think that has served me well when I moved over to the pharmaceutical industry. I actually had uh, one, of my, uh, one of my mentors there was uh, 
Mitch Daniels. Uh, so he was running corporate affairs before Alex Azar was, and obviously before he became uh, governor. Um, but he really taught me how um, complex companies think about the intersection of policy and business. Um, and trying to translate that then to going over to the insurance side. Um, and so um, the thing with Mitch is you never went into a meeting unprepared. He would call BS on you in two seconds. Mm -hmm. So you say, uh, sorry, Mitch, I don't know. Well, let me go look into that. Um, and trying to make sure that you're really straightforward about what you know and what you don't know. You used a word that Andy also word. You both use the word holistically. When you talk about looking at this holistically, what do you mean, Andy? Talking about what the, the law, the ACA? Well, look, I mean, it, it can't be fun for anybody, uh, let alone the Trump administration, to implement a law they don't believe in. Um, now, the reality is they don't get to make that decision. Many Congresses before me got to decide what laws I implemented. I never once woke up and thought, do I like this law? Do I not like this law? Do I want to implement it? Do I want to undermine it? Uh, that just wasn't my job, but it's quite honestly not theirs. Having said that, um, that creates a lot of uncertainty for these guys and the companies they represent because every day they don't know what to expect. Um, now, having said that, insurance companies are making record profits in the market, in the insurance market, and many of them are going to expand. And many of them want to you expand. need to specify which part yes. of the market. <laughs> Since ours <laughs> right. are nonprofit companies with <laughs> right. margins of 1% to 2%, just to clarify. Right. And nonprofit companies do make profits too. Yeah. But um, and you, you work, represent a fantastic set of right. nonprofit companies. And these guys, I know them both, um, are, are terrific people, despite what people say about lobbyists. <laughs> these guys are actually really um, among, the, among really good people and friends. Uh, but but I, look, I'm not as worried about the market and I, uh, for the reason that I think, um, let's, I mean, there, there are a lot of natural market monopolies going on right now. And guess what? Monopolies allowed, have allowed a lot of these companies to make money. And a lot of them lost money in the first couple of years, and now they've made money. And I think they want to stay in. What they want and is a very, very reasonable thing, which is a signal from the administration to say, we're not going to mess with this thing. We're going to, we may not like it. We may not have voted for it. We don't love it, but it's law, and we're going to implement it to the best of our ability. I think that's the reasonable thing to expect. And I think you'd see expansion. I think you'd see rates start to come down. Not enough. I think there's things that can be done. These These... These guys are right, there's other things that can be done. But, you know, as I step back and look at this market, it's in a position to be much healthier if there were just, I think, a reasonable implementation effort. You know, though, getting to the cost question, and I share Matt's concerns about 2019 premiums on the individual market, but let's be honest, the insurance premiums are a reflection of the cost of care in our society today. That's hospital costs, physician visits, specialists, and prescription drugs. Those are the drivers of your premiums. So as much as you get frustrated about your premium or your copay or de your deductible, as a nation, we've got to be really willing to look at the underlying cost of care. And we also have to look at the health and well-being of our nation. The work that you do, how do you align providers and payers together? Well, uh, again, I'm very fortunate in that all of our members uh, believe in this uh, particular model in the United States in which we think that the closer you can get the health plan and the providers, your clinical care team together, uh, the better it is for patients, for health outcomes, for communities, and cost. So many of our members are integrated delivery systems. They've got that all under an umbrella. Think a Geisinger in Pennsylvania. Uh, think Health Park partners in Minnesota. There are a number of these uh, around the country. But then we have others that may not be in the same legal entity, but have these very close partnerships. And we see over and over again, when you get everybody with the same incentives, and they're all aligned around the patient, and they don't have the perverse fee-for-service type of incentives, you have much better health outcomes over and over again. So we're just a big, we believe in that model, and we think that there's quality data and health outcomes data to support it. Andy, Obamacare, I think you said this, or it was in a, in a, in a panel you were on, the, the idea came up that Obamacare changed expectations. Uh, how can that be used to help create a fairer and better healthcare system for all? 
How can that be used by politicians, by voters? I think the thing where we wrestled with, you know, if all of us who are old enough to think back to the last decade, um, you know, wrestling with the idea that there are a set of basics that we as Americans have as a compact uh, with the insurance we get, that if we have a pre-existing condition, you can still be covered and can't be charged more, that you get preventive care, that there's no lifetime caps, that there's a set of essential benefits, argue over what those are. You know, that, that's a dramatic change. I mean, that's a hundred year change that we made in a short period of time. And, you know, obviously people are still arguing over it because it's had consequences, some good, some bad, uh, in terms of overall price and everything else. But that's to be expected. I think we should expect that changes go down hard, everybody has to do things differently. You know, there's a certain amount of resistance, but you should also hope that everybody tries to figure out the best answers towards working on it. I think what, uh, I think that shaped the nature of the economy, it shapes the nature of healthcare costs, a lot of things. But the repeal fight over the last year shapes even more. Uh, because I think over the last year, we saw Americans around the country really facing an existential threat as to whether or not their access to health care was going to continue. And you could, you could threaten a lot of things for people, but you threaten their ability to care for their families. You threaten a mom's ability to care for their chronically ill kid. Watch the hell out. And that's what happened. I really believe that's what happened. And I've, I've traveled around the country. I've met with 38,000 Americans at this point, talking to them about their health care. And I can tell you, doesn't matter whether they voted for Trump, doesn't matter whether they voted for Clinton, doesn't matter at all. When you get down to the basic question, the basic level of their feeling of their ability to afford health care, it's existential to them. And I think that is um, having and will have a ripple effect over the next several years into how people think about politics, how they think about health care choices, and possibly over the next decade, how we think about the, the major choices we make as a country. And, and I'll just add to that, I mean, I agree completely with Andy. Um, it's really changed, I think, the nature of the dialogue around Medicaid in particular. Um, I think the repeal and replace discussions about the sort of fundamental changes to the payment for how Medicaid would move forward really made people sort of step back and say, you know, what is the role of Medicaid in terms of providing a safety net? You know, right now it's over 70 million people that are covered through Medicaid, 55 million plus through Medicaid managed care plans. They're getting access to care. You know, there had been this narrative that in some places, maybe you'd be better off being uninsured rather than having Medicaid. And I think, you know, that's been clearly debunked. We actually put out a study this morning that looked at access to care in Medicaid um, and shows, you know what, you're getting much better access um, to preventive um, care and treatments. You're getting similar to what you're seeing in the commercial market and two, three, four times better access, of course, than if you're not covered at all. Um, and I think people recognize that Medicaid today is a critical safety net, and particularly those who you know, are working and need access to coverage and maybe aren't getting it through their employer, but not making a lot of money. Medicaid expansion has been a terrific um, result for them. Not talking about Medicaid specifically, but you know there are people who say it's not worth it for me to have insurance at this point. It's not worth it for my family. I have to pick my mortgage and food or insurance. Right, and, and I'd say that that's that very, it's a, it's a really critical problem, but it's a portion of those individuals that are buying insurance on their own without help of an employer or not through Medicare or not through Medicaid, right? I mean, it's, it's not good that you have a couple of million people that are in that circumstance. And I think that's one of the reasons why we were so focused on trying to get that stability package in there. It's those individuals who are, not, who are making just too much money to qualify for subsidies, that they're having to pay 100% out of their own pocket, and plus they're paying with after-tax dollars. There's no other portion of you know, the real economy that, or, or population that's paying with it, right? If you get it through your employer, you're able to use pre-tax dollars. But if you're buying coverage on your own, hopefully you're getting a subsidy. But if not, then you're paying the most out of any portion of the population. And that's something that we need to look at. You guys have a real challenge, though, I can't think of a less popular word in the English language than deductible. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's um, you know, over, I think, the next number of years, I think you guys are going to be challenged to answer the question, what ac actual value do you add? Mm. And um, I think while your points are right, there are circumstances, there's lots of other politics uh, uh, around it, uh, I think if the insurance companies don't figure out how to answer that, not to Washington, 
but to the American public, um, you guys are going to be right in, a, in, a, in an existential crisis I think you've never seen before. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why I'm, I love our model, because it's not just insurer writing claims, but it's actually working with your entire clinical care team. And it's ensuring that there is all of that coordination between all of the different primary care docs, specialists, uh, more and more of your care is virtual nowadays or will be in the near future. Um, we're all very mobile. And so in this dynamic environment, to have that partnership on working on your behalf, I think, is exactly the value add. We saw Maryland last month get pretty aggressive about trying to protect the parts of ACAA you've seen. I think you mentioned Alaska, Minnesota. Um, where have you seen this work? What other leaders in the industry, what other states, what other politicians you think are really being leaders on this issue? Well, we just heard from Governor Baker this morning, and uh, you know he was reminding the audience that first of all, there is an individual mandate here in Massachusetts, and it ensures that you have much broader participation, which not to get too wonky, but that's how you have a better mm -hmm. risk pool to spread around the cost and the risks. That's an important thing. When the CSRs disappeared at the end of 2017, Massachusetts came in with its own money to continue that support. He also has an incredible incredibly innovative uh, request for a Medicaid waiver that would allow this state to try formularies. Now, I guess he and others are a little pessimistic at the moment as to whether or not you can do waivers uh, that have to do with pharmaceuticals. But at least, you know, in a state like Massachusetts, you're seeing a lot of ideas over many, many years, and a lot of pilots and demonstrations. And frankly, the rest of the country has learned a lot from Massachusetts over the years when it comes to health care. Matt, for you, who do you think is being yeah, a leader? Um, so I think the states really that have stepped up that you've mentioned, Allison, um, to really try and look at their individual market. Also those states that you know, are out there pushing for Medicaid expansion, right? What we're seeing, for example, in you know, Virginia with new Governor Northam um, down there trying to find a way to get to a Medicaid expansion, even though the environment's really challenging, right? I, I think in some cases there's a recognition that you know, there needs to be some trade-offs and if trying to get coverage for people through Medicaid, you need to come up with some sort of what would be a reasonable work standard or a community engagement standard, then that might be something that's worth pursuing. So I think it's those governors particularly that are trying to look creatively about how can they help their individual um, residents and citizens um, out there, certainly at a, at a national level. I mean, we we're um, you know, working very closely with people like Senator Alexander and Senators Murray, and there are a lot of great ideas out there. And the question is, you know, what can we do now between where we are today, April 9th, and the end of the year, or just looking ahead to try and make sure that we're able to you know, put in place some, some efforts uh, and measures that will, that will make the health insurance system better. Well, what is your priority when you take over? June 1st, right? <laughs> June 1st, yes. Um, uh, sending Marilyn off uh, <laughs> with a great, uh, uh, she's been Marilyn Taverner, my boss, um, who I know Andy knows, Cece <laughs> knows. She has been just a pillar of strength at AHIP over the past three years. Um, when I think about what I want to focus on, I really want to focus on working with our members um, to make the healthcare system simpler for consumers, right? And focus on how do we simplify, to Andy's point, that consumer experience. We all have examples from our own lives, you know, whether it be within our, our families, friends, or others who have had encounters with the healthcare system that just are, um, are, are just, Bad. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, right? Bad, yes. They're terrible, right? I mean, I have an experience with my son where he had reconstructive foot surgery, and it was a terrible experience. And I work in healthcare. <laughs> yeah. um, and trying to find ways that we, we can really make that, that experience much better for consumers. And then the other point that Cece mentioned is affordability, is really working collaboratively across the healthcare system to see if we can push aggressively for some more measures to make the system more affordable. Who would stand in your way of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's just a couple of people who, you know, might have a different point of view depending upon what industry they're in. Like? <laughs> like my old friends in the pharmaceutical industry, some in the provider community. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. And like when I just think about the pharmaceutical industry today, the economics of that industry 
are very different than they were you know, a decade or so ago when I was in it. I mean, when I was working um, for companies, we were trying to demonstrate the value of you know, treatments for depression, hypertension, um, as saying, you know, you can spend a couple of dollars a day on a cup of coffee at Starbucks, or you can treat depression. Now we're talking about products that cost you know, more than a, a car, a house, two houses, mm -hmm. really depending upon where you live. And so the economics are just so different today than they were a decade ago. I'm going to ask uh, Andy one more question, and then we'll go for questions in the audience. Um, I, this is almost a personal question for you. As you watch uh, Seema Verma take over your old job at CMS, uh, what do you think about some of her proposals and ideas? Oh, I'm going to avoid uh, talking about any individuals. And look, my, I wish. What about what about her idea wish. that uh, that there should be some skin in the game, that there be some sort of work element to getting your talk about? I'll talk about the idea, but I'm going to avoid talking about individuals. I wish oh yeah, no, I mean the idea. All, all the best, yeah. Um, uh, and look, I mean, part of that is President Obama set in stone for us that we will do everything we can to make our successors successful, no matter what their ideas and policies are, mm -hmm. uh, because that's what Bush did for him, and he expects us to do that. So I, that's an ongoing commitment that I'll have. I mean, look, the, the question that you're, that you're asking is this, this notion now that's getting baked in to some of the state waiver requests, which say, um, if people lose their job, they should also lose their health care. And let me just be clear, um, my youngest son heard, hearing about what's going on in Kentucky in the radio, just asked me one question. He said, Dad, is this about trying to get more people jobs, or is it about trying to take health care away from people? And the request says that there's an 80,000, in, in Kentucky, this request presumes that 80,000 people will lose coverage. And it's mostly because people's lives in Medicaid, if you follow them, their income levels change, their job statuses change frequently. And so putting in place a bureaucracy which says you need to report back to us every time this happens, is just an easy way to, if you wanted to get people out of the system and pay less money, it's an easy way to do it. And, and that's really what's, what's behind this, in, in my view. Hmm. Um, I do think Democrats have to understand the fact that you know, there is a, a sentiment in the country which says you know, we shouldn't allow people to have something for nothing, and that people should take some responsibility for their own health and their care. And, and I think those are, those are very reasonable ideas and are important ideas. But what's being implemented um, you know, it would, would result in about a million people losing coverage. And it would set, a, a, if it was implemented across the 10 states, that have requested it. And I think, it's, I think it's not a place we as a country want to go. I think it takes us further from our ideals. Um, but let's deal with the challenging issues. And let's, um, let's understand, uh, though, that you know, if it were, it, all I should say is there's a bill in Minnesota, I'll just finish with this, okay. that says that, fine, let's do that, but let's do it for legislators too. So every legislator has to, be, has to report in every time they want to um, continue their coverage. They have to go report into an agency. Let's, say, let's all the rest of us agree that our healthcare should be dependent on a bureaucracy working well for us. Fine, then let's do it for all of us. Then I'm good with it. <laughs> let's uh, get to our microphones. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> I know you do out there. There right we here. go. Barbara Marino from Vertex. Curious, oh, I'll sit back down, Pharma. But curious, <laughs> Medicare is nowhere in your discussion, nowhere in this I'll two talk sessions. About it. Please do, because yeah, I think yeah. it's a continuum. And we've mm -hmm. got more and more people out there in that payer system, too. They're more and more worried. Great. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. More and more worried, you said? About cost, sure. Yes. So uh, Medicare uh, currently is consuming about 15% of the federal budget on its way to, if it stays on this trajectory, about 18% by 2025 or 27, I think. That's due in, in part uh, to the baby boomers, more and more of them coming in. So it's demographics. Um, I actually was going to... Uh, pick Medicare Advantage in particular mm -hmm. to talk about, which is turning into a more and more of, I think, a healthcare success story in the United States. About 33% of Medicare beneficiaries today have chosen, you know, voluntarily MA plans. Um, we are seeing a star rating system on quality that digs into 42 or 43 measures, meaningful measures, uh, you know, uh, diabetes control, hypertension control, access to your doctor, access 
access to your prescription medications. Um, that's a very transparent system. Uh, and there are some quality bonuses to the plans that hit those four and five stars. Uh, so you're really seeing, um, I think, uh, a bright spot in our healthcare system today. And this administration has uh, put more and more flexibility into Medicare Advantage. So we're incredibly excited that in the next couple of years, you're going to be able to do much more telemedicine in Medicare Advantage. I know from my 80-year-old mother in Naples, Florida, who likes to do FaceTime with her grandkids, this is going to be super convenient for her. Um, you're also going to be able to build into your Medicare Advantage programs now a lot of what have been called supplemental benefits that can help seniors, frankly, age in place and live home independently healthy for a long time. Uh, so whether it's nutrition, transportation, uh, things around your house to prevent falls, which are just mm -hmm frankly, deadly for a lot of seniors, literally. Um, so that is a really encouraging avenue uh, of partnership with this administration. And anyone who has creative ideas within MA, bring them in, because they want to hear them. Well, we're going to end on that, because it's a positive yeah. note. Let's thank our panel. Thank you.